So, uh, composing, bringing attention, paying attention. Now, attention then is, uh, is you know, is alert. It's not a, just a passive state. When they say surrender and use words like that, sometimes it gives the impression of a kind of resignation. Uh, just the, the power of a word, <clears throat> how it affects our consciousness. And so this is where you, you know, I encourage you to really notice how words do affect you. So that you you know you you begin to not be just bound to habitual patterns and interpretations of English words or poly words, but you're actually you know looking at you know certain words when affect me like this and when I, when the word surrender I remember is. <coughs> Even though I've, to me, this isn't just a passive uh, as a resignation to the present, giving up, but it is a, it's a kind of relaxing into the present and being attentive and alert in the present. So, I mean, this is. You know, we people have different reactions to the word, so and you just do it and observe your own how how particular word affects affects you. So it's like the sense of a self. We use the we we use the word selfish, someone that only cares about themselves. And this is oftentimes used as a kind of Intimidation, you know, selfishness is bad. It's not the idea of being caring about others, which it tends to be much more kind of inspiring and a beautiful concept. Then say, just observe yourself. Look at the, the language as something, you know, as a tool to use, not just, you know, to think that that uh, even the way we, you know, we make assumptions, especially if you're uh, kind of, if English is your first language, it's a, a language of habit. It's easily, you know, we just uh, acquire it from our parents and and uh, society. So it, it, English can be just a, a force of habit, and in this reflective reflectiveness, uh, we began to, uh, you know, just notice how, how we even, you know, sometimes we we don't even use our own language that well, because it can be just uh, habitual thinking and assumptions we make. So I like to see language as a kind of invest in observing the ability to think have words, define them, the effect they have on consciousness. And this, of course, is the intuitive awareness where we, you know, we can uh, observe this. But it is a communicative function, so it's not to be despised, it's a great gift, but uh, in alert attention, in awareness, intuitive intelligence, then language is something that we begin to uh, maybe use, uh, see as a, as a tool for communication, rather than as just a habitual pattern of thought and assumption that we we might tend to do if we if we didn't notice
like the words uh, self-inquiry is uh, looking into self what is self and in this way when you're reflecting on this it's not to to come up with the kind of traditional answers or definitions of self but it's it, it's really uh, try questioning and, and kind of observing what self really is as a as a reality as something that that uh, we can uh, just operate from the sense of self in the, in a habitual way then that is the sakya ditti the conditioned personality And this, this way of reflecting, I mean, it's something to really take an interest in and not, not try to get uh, kind of intellectual answers, but use it as a, as a tool to really question. And this questioning then is, is really uh, like a determination to, to not just settle for something, but to use it to keep that attention on particular emphasis like what is self what is Sakya Ditti at this moment and so when I do this like, like a question when you ask yourself a question it, the, that form leaves a, a kind of space doesn't it and you say what is self and then the, there's a kind of gap there it stops the the uh, flow of the thought if you, if you have a question I mean, a, a, a sentence uh, then it, it easily goes from one thing to the next you know the, just the, the wandering mind co uh, connects one word with the next but a question actually stops the thinking mind and you begin to notice this like the koan or these conundrums that that can be used. Who am I or what is the self? And uh, seeing that this form of questioning isn't to isn't being used just to to have some easy answer to the question, but to stop that momentum of thought by and and recognizing. The, the gap or the the stopping of the thinking mind or what is it that's conscious right now who is if there's no self then who is conscious or is there a uh, what happens when the when we die what gets reborn and these kind of questions are quite common in the Buddhist uh, discussions. You know, what, if if there's this rebirth, and what, when we die, what is it that gets reborn? If there's no soul, or no self. <clears throat> and of course, we can come from <clears throat> from a more kind of speculative <clears throat> assumptions about. You know, the explaining it through the Paticca Samupada or uh, trying to to uh, come up with a, with some kind of theory about what happens uh, uh, when we die, when our body dies. But actually, at this moment, when I ask that question to myself, the the thinking process stops. Is it like not knowing? Now I can have theories, you know, about what what goes on after the body dies, and I'm not denying the, the those theories or you know trying to uh, just uh, deny rebirth or reincarnation, but. What we can really know in a direct way is always here and now. It's not something that 
what happens when my body dies, I, you know, at this moment the body's a breathing, conscious form. So if I do, I, you know, if I, I can speculate or I have maybe preferences about, you know, Buddhist views or, or, um, whatever, uh, these are ideas that I picked up. But the reality is I don't really know that. Because the body at this moment is not dead, it's alive, it's like this. So in reflecting on the way it is, it's not trying to, to figure out everything from the macrocosmic position, but from the kind of humbling position of just observing the way it is within the, this present moment as uh, one is experiencing it. To know not knowing is knowing, isn't it? You know, what, what happens when, what will happen to me, to me when my body dies? And I say, well, be reincarnated, next life. Uh, will I be, what will I be born as? Uh, can, can you be, if you've been, if this is, you know, that human, human incarnation, can we actually be reborn at, at a lower form? Could we be reborn as a worm or a frog or something? I remember, <laughs> I was in Australia years ago, <laughs> there's controversy going on among theosophists in Perth about this, whether the, the <laughs> You know, you could actually, you know, if you have human birth in this, at this time, your next life, could you, uh, be reborn on a, in a lower level or the same or the higher? And some had, uh, had very strong views. There was kind of a, a kind of, uh, argument or, you know, feelings of, uh, strong feelings about this. You know, some people felt very offended at the fact that, the possibility of having to be reborn as a as a worm or a frog. <coughs> but the truth of the matter is, I don't know. At this moment, and I, you know, I, my preferences might be, uh, you know, for the the rebirth process. It just gets better and better, or if I've been a naughty monk and been corrupt and immoral, I might get reborn in, in a lower level. This is speculation, isn't it? This, I'm speculating at this moment, possibilities. Well, I'm not denying any possibility either, but just recognizing that's reality of not knowing. In the reflection on the Dhamma, it's a liberation here and now. There's, you know, in the, uh, the Buddha wasn't teaching a kind of uh, specula speculative theory or doctrinal positioning. Uh, to to grasp in order to uh, come from from a position of any sort. So the awakening or the alertness in the present. This is the whole. This is the essence. This is the purpose of the four noble truths. It's not to grasp or believe or deny, but to encourage, point to uh, awakened alertness, attention. And self-inquiry or looking, you know, questioning yourself is, I found like a real uh, kind of determination until you have a kind of breakthrough where you, you keep, keep at it, keep noticing 
this gap when you ask a question like who am I this, that empty gap there before your mind starts thinking up some answer to the question being alert to to where the thinking process stops the gaps after a question the, or before you think the question just notice the that empty space before you think the question, who am I? And this, this puts, puts, you know, helps just by pursuing that quite intensely, uh, determinedly until you, you really, uh, you know, in, it's not just a, a technique that you you're using in a perfunctory way, but you're actually using th- this way of questioning in order to increase the alertness, not to try to just feed your intellect with a with a clever answer to the question, but to observe the the space, the background. So that's why they, when I use the, the words about listening, I found, you know, I have a, the way I experience my personality is it kind of natters away. And, uh, and, and you know, it just, and I can listen to myself, <clears throat> to my personality. And so I always had this uh, this kind of image of being the witness, the listener, not taking sides, not judging. I'm not, but just a, a kind of someone that's listening to somebody else talking. And so that personality will will ha- will go on in in its way, its force of habit. But relationship to it is listening. And then, what is it, or who is it that can listen to me, my personality, you know, go on its usual routines of liking, disliking, proving, disapproving, preferring, loving, hating, taking sides, worrying, resenting, and so forth. And uh, it's like, what, what is it that can listen? And what is it that's listening and witnessing? And of course, uh, you know, if you're, if you're really surrendering to this awareness, this alert attention, then you begin to uh, see through that, that kind of subtlety of the mind to want to have find out in words or some kind of defined form what it is that lives a soul is it my true self is it the Buddha nature is it you know the different words that that uh, we we gravitate to to explain it but does it need explaining you know because in this way the whole uh, Thinking mind is is put in a context. It's a, it's an object of co- through consciousness, not the subject anymore. So I, me, mine, my loves, my hates, my fears, my desires, my problems, myself. That arises and ceases, that sense of me uh, as a self, as a person. 
And so this is like discerning, alert attention, discerning. Uh, say it's like a universal intelligence. It's not uh, acquired knowledge that we get through education, through conditioning. So it's not a personal thing. It's not even, you know, an illiterate person, uh, you know, isn't precluded from paying attention, being alert, and seeing through delusion. So then uh, this, this space, you know, if, when, when there's no self operating, when this gap is here, this silence. And one can see the kind of, the habitual kind of reaction to it, the silence, per se, most people probably is very threatening. It's a, uh, you know, these dreaded silent periods, you know, we want to fill the mind with something, have something that, you know, we can, you know, even worry uh, is we fill the mind with all possibilities of failure or misery or humiliation or whatever in the future. Or just distracting the mind endlessly, you know, seeking something to do. Restlessness. Uh, This is a restless realm. The sense realm uh, is one that's changing all the time. The body is a restless formation. The the uh, the mental conditions come and go and change. And so, restlessness is it's part of our you know, what we can witness, the kind of restlessness of just the, how the body feels or emotionally, uh, your, what you're experiencing emotionally in the present. Wanting something to do, feeling ill at ease, uncomfortable, embarrassed, self-conscious. But in, when you begin to recognize the value of awareness, you know, it's like you're coming from the source then. Then the, then the thoughts that come from that source are not just, you know, wandering mind and habitual assumptions and thinking on a personal level, but then language can be used much more skillfully for inquiry to focus on a particular delusion we might have, like self, the, the, the personality, the sense of myself as a separate entity, as a person, as a soul. So it's not just a one-off kind of question, but like uh, you know, is is I like one one kind of simile I, I read years ago about a rat chewing through a wall. You know, you just keep chewing till you break through. <clears throat> and uh, what is it? You know, he, pressing it and just. Increasing the alertness, the attention, and this sense of listening, and using this uh, ability to question, and listening to yourself questioning. And recognizing that that which is aware, that listening, before the question questioner arises, the the gap when you ask the question the kind of blank state the the non plus thinking mind is this way 
And so you, you, you uh, recognize this. This is it. This is it. It's this stillness, this alert stillness, this poised attention. Uh, it's a receptive state. It's not fixed on anything, you know, like uh, attached to anything. It's consciousness unattached. Consciousness is operating. So, like being conscious and still is like this. And then, you know, that, that noting, it's this way. And then there's, then there, then you can, you know, be a personality, but your relationship to personality is one of witnessing rather than becoming it. <coughs> and so, you know, the really, uh, I found it's so helpful to listen to my personality. I'm not just trying to get rid of sakya ditti as if it was some kind of disease that, uh, ailment that I had to, to destroy. It's not an annihilationist, uh, inclination to destroy, have no personality whatsoever as some kind of ideal. But, uh, the, getting beyond the limitation of the personality, which is conditioned, isn't it? Me being Arjun Sumato, that's a condition. That's a, you know, it's a, it has its use sometimes. <clears throat> but it's, you know, it's not a, it's not that I can't, you know, it's, it's not a, something that is natural in this conscious state. It comes and goes according to other conditions. The annihilationist tendency, uh, like Theravada usually kind of, you know, as a just uh, intellectual grasping seems to, you know, on the, on the conceptual level, seems to move towards a, more of an annihilationism. Because it doesn't, it, it doesn't uh, present kind of metaphysical ideals to, to grasp. Like eternal life, or, or you know, kind of views of uh, that uh, what, I, what I would call metaphysical positioning. So it's easy to, if you're just grasping the Theravada structure as a, as an intellectual exercise, it you know, you think of nibbana as extinction, or you've got to get rid, you know, the fetters. Uh, the, the sakya ditti, you shouldn't have any, you know, you shouldn't be selfish. Pers- uh, there's no self, and everything is impermanent, and all that arises ceases, cessation is, re- is reality. And of course, this way of thinking, uh, uh, just grasping this, this, the logic that comes from that way of thinking uh, is what I would definitely call annihilationism. And that's that's the limitation of uh, of the thought process, which is dualistic. You know, so you have you have if you you know annihilationism can be a very negative kind of state, and um, you know, there's nothing. It's all impermanent. There's no self. There's no God. There's no soul. And nothing, and and we're practicing here to extinguish ourselves. All I want is oblivion, just not be anymore, just not exist, not be conscious, like a suicidal death wish. Or the more positive side, the thinking, you know, the 
allusion to a be union with God, ultimate uh, bliss, uh, eternal bliss. Uh, you know, where my true self, the real me, uh, finds eternal happiness in a state of love and hap and uh, bliss and peace forevermore. And these are, this is a positive kind of eternalistic. Uh, opposite to the annihilationist extreme. And the, the one is quite inspiring, isn't it? You know, to conceive of eternal happiness and love. These are positive terms. They're, you know, they, they arouse, they can inspire, uplift. And the other... Uh, it tends to be more cynical and and uh, and see you know just want to disappear, dissolve into nothingness. And this is just this is language, isn't it? And uh, when we, the word nibbana, then you know, is a it can be seen as a state of eternal bliss or or extinction. But one reason why I like the word is because it it doesn't really, you know, it it doesn't lend itself that easily to one extreme or the other. You know, it's kind of enigmatic. What does it mean? Literally, what? It's literal interpretation. You got it cool, cooling off, or and when we. The extinction, what is, does that mean? Like a total extinction, annihilation of everything, or the ending? If something is extinguished, you know, like a, a candle flame, you know, if you, if you put out the candle on the shrine, extinguish the flame, you know, is that the end of fire? You know, does that mean there's no more fire in the universe? You completely annihilate <laughs> fire, or is that particular flame it's ceased the conditions for it to exist no longer are present, but fire is still you know the the uh, fire element still operating, so you just scratch a little stick on a rough piece of sandpaper, and flame appears. Suddenly it rises again. So the fire is not the, you know, fire is the, can, we can use fire for destruction. Or we can use it skillfully, you know, to keep warm, light the room and things like this. So the fire is not nothing, you know, uh, to, to try to annihilate, but to, you know, it takes attention, alertness, Mindfulness, wisdom to be able to use fire so that it's helpful, conducive, rather than destructive. And so that's out to each one of us, isn't it? It's not, we can't blame the fire, but it's, uh, you know, our own use of, of that ability. that might be very evil or silly or foolish or wise, skillful. So the Buddha pointed to things like non-attachment, non-self, desirelessness. Isn't the destruction of desire, is it? We're not annihilating desire but just being obsessed, taken over by desire, isn't it? It's like being caught in the fire, you know, with no no way of just letting it burn us up, destroying ourselves, destructive force that that uh 
causes us a lot of pain, like grasping a fire hurts, doesn't it? When you put your finger in the flame on the candle, it, you feel it. It's painful. So you don't, you, you realize that you don't do that. You don't go around grasping it once you realize that, that, the, that it hurts. Painful to do that. So you, you learn how to use fire in a way that isn't destructive or harmful. Use the conscious formation, this body, its uh, mental faculties in ways that are conducive towards relaxation, understanding, happiness in the world. So in, in terms of annihilationism, it <coughs> Buddha wasn't, he you know, made it very clear in the, in the uh, Tamajaka Pavatana Sutta, the first sermon, it, Gama Sukali Kani Yoko Matanu Yoko. It's not it's not one extreme, the eternalist view or the annihilationist one. It's the Majima Bhatibata, the middle way. The middle way as an intellectual concept sounds like kind of mediocre compromise, doesn't it? The extremes are much more kind of fascinating. Being eternally happy is more interesting than, say, uh, or annihilation is, you know, total destruction, Armageddon, all the, these, this can be quite exciting to the mind. Powerful concepts. Middle way, can, you know, on the intellectual level sounds like a kind of compromise for mediocrity. Or is it, a transcendence, and a transcendence of of no longer being caught in that dualistic pattern, that linear pattern of thought <coughs> that comes out of ignorance. So this is why exploring, you know, recognizing what what thinking really is as experience. You, you know, listen to yourself thinking is that. Not to condemn or judge your thoughts, as, you know, in, in terms, you're not, you're not listening in order to criticize the way you're thinking or your personality, but to put it in the context that you can actually see it for what it is, rather than be just bound to it, or just somebody who's trying to, to destroy their personality. So in the, like the three fetters, the ten fetters, this, this, this teaching in, in, uh, you know, the four stages, the sak, the sotapanna, sakada, kami, anakami, arahant, is tied to the ten fetters. I found this a really skillful reflection using this, this, uh, in order to understand Not to kind of bind myself to to that to those concepts, but to use those concepts for for observing my experience in the present. And so the, the three fet- first three fetters are the uh, the obstruction to stream entry or seeing the path clearly, insightfully insightfully knowing the the path or the fourth noble truth, the way of non-suffering. So, now from my own investigation of Sakya Ditti Sila Bhattabharamasa Vichikita, Sakyaditi, the self view, personality view, the conditioned self. And uh, then really, and, and so exploring that, this, the self, the assumptions of a separate self, me as a person, 
uh, me as the five khandhas, all the identities, the assumptions, the memories, uh, the fears and desires that arise from from uh, attaching to this uh, self, this created self. And the only way I could really, you know, get it, understand it is by listening to myself. So, in, 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 you know, this, uh, listening to myself thinking. So the attention is is not one of criticism. It's not thinking whether I, my thoughts are right or wrong or good or bad, but observing uh, this uh, obsession with me as a person, my position, my my presence, my appearance. sense of my self-worth am I a really good person or bad person am I lovable or not worthy, unworthy the fears the threats the whatever you know that, that the sense of a self uh, bring up in, into consciousness now the the relationship then yeah, awareness of self rather than than trying to destroy it or judge it even even uh, even me at my worst you know totally self centered and and obsessed and angry and resentful is not to promote that but to recognize it. from this position of the puto, the awareness, the listener, the receiver, uh, and, 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 it, and, it, and it's open to the, just the self in whatever form it manifests, good or bad, right or wrong, peaceful, excited, confused, stupid, intelligent. These are the qualities of self that change, isn't it? The self is is very, you know, changes according to conditions. So really, recognizing that that which listens to self is not self. Because when I use the word self, it it has to be you know, it, it has a quality to it, a sense of separateness, a sense of me, and 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 the the fears and and obsessions that create me as a person. But there's also, if I just listen to those obsessions, pay attention, but not judge them, because I, when I start judging myself, then I'm back into the self again. It's self judging self. You know, I have ideas of what a good monk should be and if I were a good monk then I should be like this this is this is a self creating itself it gets no perspective it merely can only criticize because uh, you know on the level of of a really wonderful self kind compassionate good honest dependable integral Fine, upstanding citizen, though these are, these are, you know, admirable qualities, inspiring positive views of what one should be as a self. And then the, then the other side, the dark side, <coughs> the, the self-obsessed, the childish, the foolish, the frightened self is then seen as inferior, bad, uh, feel guilty about it. And we, you know, and we're in a whole world of complexity, kind of bound into this, into a very confused realm of, of concepts, ideas, habits. So the only way out of that is by trusting in the awareness, listening to it. So confusion, doubt, worry, sense of 
worthlessness, lack of self-respect, all this is still self. Or positive view, I'm very noble person, I'm, you know, or eager, even, you know, I'm the best or the finest or the greatest, it goes to one extreme or the other. Or even the view that I'm just an ordinary bloke, like everyone else, uh, not better, worse, that's, that's still a self, isn't it? Because you create it. To define yourself, you have to use words. But that which is attentive to the thinking process, then, is is not a thought anymore. It's not limited to to the concept, but it certainly aware of the noble self or the uh, ignoble self as it as it uh, arises and ceases. So when there's no sense of self, you know, the recognition, the the, re, the realizing of this non-self is like this. And then, the, the, you know, the, there's alertness, there's attention, mindfulness, consciousness is operating, conscious. I'm not in a, in an annihilated state, a kind of or in, in a trance of any sort, fully present here and now, but just that simple, natural alertness, attentiveness in the present, which isn't forced from a sense of having to pay attention. Like I can hold the view that I should be mindful and then try to make myself mindful. And that's coming from the, the, the sense of I'm somebody who should be mindful. And that's still the the, the uh, delusion of self. Now it's very important to recognize this natural state of attentiveness, sati sampajanya. I find no self like a relief it is it's not uh, to suffer to, for me to feel that I'm suffering that I have to create myself into you know, have to create the conditions arise for, for me to suffer as a person you know it's the, the natural state of being is, isn't suffering when you really recognize it it can observe the sense or the feeling of suffering but it in in itself, it's not suffering, it's not dukkha. You know, like when I, if I get myself you know, worried, anxious, upset by something personally, you know, it's easy to just react to that and you know, just either avoiding, denying, obsessing the mind. Or, trusting in this awareness of this feeling. And this is a, this is for you to investigate, to find out, you know. Do you want to be somebody that, that's always, you know, in this confused realm of samsara, Always trying to get rid of something, control something, change something, manipulate, run away, blame. Or can you trust the awareness to just not, not annihilate that neurotic self, but to receive it, to put it in its context of Dhamma? That these these self these sense of self is, is are something that arises and ceases, you know, depending on the conditions you're around, being praised or being blamed. <clears throat> In the world, the eight worldly dhammas are being considered a successful monk or a failure, being, uh, you know, good fortune has come my way, everything is going well. 
and I'm feeling happy because, you know, everything seems to be going well in the world, or everything starts falling apart. Worldly conditions change, uh, and then I, I wasted my life, life is miserable, I get depressed as a self, as a person. So what is that that can can observe that? It can listen to to myself, you know, it being elated or depressed, feeling good, feeling bad. And so, and what is it that that can do that? You know, and and just that questioning. I can't find anything that listens, but I'm the listening itself. It's the, in the listening, that attentiveness, that isn't self. It isn't separative or div- divisive. And then um, the the second fetter, Sila Bhattabharamasa, is usually translated uh, is clinging to rites and rituals. But that, um, I mean, that that's part of it. But it doesn't say, you know, it tends to, that uh, never seemed terribly important to me because I never felt really attached to rites and rituals in the in the way that I would interpret those terms. And not because being a skeptic and uh, coming into Buddhism and as an adult, I wasn't brought up with a lot of superstitions around Buddhism. You know, in fact, the arrogance of Westerners when they go to Buddhist countries is usually, look at them bowing to those Buddha rubes, lighting incense and and all these, you know, praying to the Buddha. He's not a god and, and uh, these people are just bound to rites and rituals and I'm not, I'm a real you know I'm into the real Buddhism the pure teaching of the Buddha and then the kind of arrogance of the western Buddhists appear and have contempt for the rites and rituals that we might find in especially in Buddhist countries I've seen that a lot in Thailand western monks, you know arrogant attitudes of contempt for they think we we aren't like that and if we don't have any sila patabaramasa like those people do that are lighting the jostics and bowing and chanting in a language they probably don't understand and blah blah blah. But if you listen to that, you know, listen to this arrogant positioning that contempt for somebody else and 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 just reacting to something you don't you know you, you're not culturally conditioned to appreciate the one thing one of the big problems with many of us is like bowing to a golden image isn't it coming from Jewish or Christian backgrounds where we you know God forbid bowing down to graven images is a commandment I remember, you know, this is even though I'd given up Christianity years ago, <coughs> there's still this, this, this came up into consciousness when I started bowing to Buddha Rupa. The, Thou shalt not bow down to graven images. It's certainly a graven image, isn't it? <laughs> and I'm doing it. <laughs> and that's culturally conditioned, isn't it? That's a, that's, that's the cultural conditioning of being brought up in in the Judaism or Christianity, Islam. These are these are these are cultural conditions. So even bowing down to a graven image, believing it has magical powers and it's some kind of divine source of divinity, is one form of sila baramata. But also being attached to views that you shouldn't do it because of cultural, religious conditioning. But 
like cultural, and the Sila Bhattabara Masa seems to be more useful, uh, defined as like cultural and social conditioning. Being attached to those, because those are like cultural conditioning is so kind of ingrained in us, because we, you know, we acquire it. Uh, from you know, from the day one, we're influenced by the culture, by the family, by the religion that we're we're experiencing from infancy, and the culture that 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 manifests from that, uh, you know, the kind of attitudes of your parents and society, the assumptions. Not a lot of it's not even you know, kind of instilled in us in, in a direct way, but just being affected and brought up within a society by the the way it thinks the the assumptions it makes <clears throat> these are very powerful you know that we it's not like all that conscious uh, in us so the only way to get free from that conditioning the, and it's like the early conditioning when we're innocent babes and children before we're we're fixed into strong ego and biases and views of our social group. The only way one can get beyond that is by recognizing it in this awareness, the sila patabaramasa, the attachment to convention to cultural conditioning, to cultural assumptions, ethnicity, race, gender, all these kind of, of attitudes that come from, you know, the, the, that, are, that are culturally programmed. So this awareness and this alert attention and you begin to to notice this these these kind of conditions of assumptions quite may, because a lot of a lot of it is quite unconscious until you you really trust your awareness to allow things that you've just assumed and operate from to be received in in this conscious moment So even the way we hold uh, Buddhism, or uh, the conventions of Buddhism, the, the Bariyati Dhamma, the Vinaya, this is this is highly, you know, influenced by the cultural conditions that that we acquired before we were even before we knew anything about Buddhism. Silabhata Bharamasa is quite interesting. How to get beyond just the, the, the cultural programming is not to, to, to annihilate it, because some of it's quite good stuff, some of it is, isn't, but it's not, it's not a judgment about as cultural conditioning is somehow bad or wrong, but it, as, you know, if we don't, See it for what it is, then we 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 are always limited by that particular programming. It's hard to to get perspective on it because it, it's quite it oftentimes is momentum of habit and assumptions and attitudes that have never maybe been questioned before or seen in any direct way because so much of it comes from the early years. We, we, you know, it's not like you learned it in school. It's a, something you pick up through just living in a particular ethnic group or social group. So these are, you know, like Sakya Ditti is and Sila Bhattabharamasa are, these are, you know, created conditions by human beings, by ignorant human beings. 
You know, so we, you know, there's a conditioning process. The stakititi silabhata bhāramātha. And that which is aware of them then isn't, you know, it, it's not a critical function, it's recognizing them as all that arises ceases. Putting them in the context, and our refuge isn't in, no longer in cultural values or self views, but in the awareness. And even our conventional, uh, conventional realities of being Buddhist samanas and that is, is then put in a context, uh, not identity anymore, personal identity with it, but it's, uh, it's used as skillful means for awareness. And then the third, uh, vichikita, doubt. And this, uh, this also see is a, to doubt you have to think. You know, and that depends on language, memory and language. So, and language is possible for us because we have retentive memory. If we didn't have retentive memory, we wouldn't be able to think with language. We wouldn't be able to remember the, the language at all. So we retain, we have this retentive memory. We learn the, the language, you know, of our peers. And then, then the, the limitation of thinking is always, it, it, uh, you know, always leaves a sense of uncertainty. Because language itself, being attached to ideas and thoughts, is, uh, you know, very changeable and, uh, uncertain. And so we ask for certitude sometimes in, in our, tell me everything is okay, even though it isn't. You know, just, well, you know, from the sources of, sources of authority outside, we we ask confirmation, affirmation, certainty, on the level of concepts and ideas. But no matter how positive somebody can be in totally affirming some something that uh, you know the future for us and and all, through concepts, there's still this. You know, if you really look, it, a doubt arises. So, in in some religions, they they say doubt is the uh, is the devil. You know, tempt the tempter, the force of evil. You should just totally believe in what we say, and doubting is forbidden. So, so you know, like some religions depend a lot on affirmation, just continuous self affirmation group affirmation and then somebody says well maybe that's not right and then they're they're a heretic an apostate but in uh, this way <coughs> we're looking at doubt what what is it that is aware of uncertainty not knowing insecurity doubt you know, so you can explore that. And doubt is is a condition that arises and ceases. The awareness of of that doubting uncertainty. That awareness isn't doubt because it it can objectify, it can see, recognize doubt as doubt. So these three fetters, you know. These are the these are the uh, obstructions to seeing the path, and so they're they're really worth exploring in your own practice, so that you 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 know you can just through your own alertness and attentiveness begin to see the the suffering that comes from from being attached to these three fetters. So when, once you see the suffering of attachment, it's not 
an annihilation of the fetters, but it's a detaching. Consciousness, detached consciousness, the sense of a self can still arise, the cultural conditioning still operates as vipaka kama, the, the, the thinking mind can still operate. We're not annihilating any of it, but we're no longer deluded by it, letting it blind us or limit us to just the reactive uh, habits that come from that kind of attachment. So then, we say this is stream entry, sotapanna. <coughs> but then, you know, don't go around thinking I'm a sotapanna because then the, the self operates on that again. <laughs> not, not a matter of becoming one, but of seeing the path, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, it's to assume another identity. Uh, we easily, we can delude ourselves again by attaching to the to the concept of sotapanna, thinking we've really seen through the first three fetters and the the, uh, the ignorant mind can easily grasp that as some kind of personal accomplishment. It's not, is it? It's not, it's not a personal accomplishment. It's uh, through alertness, through through wisdom, we, we're seeing through these these illusions of a separate self. So it's not like becoming a stream emperor, but being, you know, recognizing, let, letting go of just the conditioning habits, not like getting rid of them, but detaching from them. So there is recognition of the path. It's just this. This is the path. It's awareness. And it's not really a path, but that's another word that we use to point to that. So don't, you know, the, even in Theravada these days, they always to put Sotapan as some kind of great, rare attainment of great masters or, you know, that, that we elevate these stages into, into, uh, great attainments. And, and by doing that, then we, then we're always feeling, uh, on a personal level, we don't explore and recognize Sakya Ditti, Siddhabhata Brahmasa, Visi Kicha, then we, then we operate from the sense of our conditioned personality, which, you know, my conditioned personality is, is, it's, it's programming tends to always feel, make me feel very distant from any kind of high attainment. My personality doesn't, you know, tends to be a critical one, so it, it, you know, if I believe it and get caught in that, then it, then it tends to, uh, you know, almost feel despair because on a personal level, I don't feel like a sotapanna. <laughs> so in, in, uh, but in, but seeing through that delusion, then, then it resolves itself, isn't it? The problem disappears if there's no self. Non-attachment is this way. So it's, you know, don't, 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 you know, get to use the convention, Theravada Buddhism, so it, you're developing wisdom, not just binding yourself to, to uh, ideas that you form about it through your cultural and intellectual conditioning. So even the concept of Arahant can sound so like Superman, you know, and you read the biography of Arjun Man and it's, God, you know, this, this guy was really, you know, like Superman, Super Bhikkhu. And it's inspiring and a kind of great story, like reading about Superman in the comics, isn't it? But, you know, it's hard to relate to it. In terms of, you know, it sounds like, oh, well, I'm not like that. I can't do that. <laughs> <clears throat> so 
So then the Ajahn Man is an, is an Arahant, and then the Arahant's really, you know, like Superman, isn't he? And then it, then it, what the mind, the intellectual mind, is, goes to that extreme of placing it high up, too high for you to ever, on a personal level, expect to, to be able to do as a person. So, see, you know, this is a way of awakening consciousness, conscious experience, not conditioning it, not trying to convince you or condition you or convert you, but to awaken, to see through the delusions we create, even around Buddhism and Buddhist Buddhist uh, teachings, because the way we grasp the scriptures and that can, you know, can be very, can be grasping out of ignorance, not out of wisdom. I mean, grasping something good, but but to, uh, the grasping is the problem, not the scripture. So the Buddha, the, look at this grasping. This is the problem. This it, it, grasping out of ignorance. So these three fetters are. If we don't penetrate those, see through them, then we we tend to to operate from that a sense of me practicing, and uh, and the and the cultural biases and and assumptions from being born in in this family in this class in this group with these identities that influences how I experience the the Buddhist uh, monastic life and then just the endless frustration of being caught in in intellectual creations that only lead to increasing sense of uncertainty and insecurity and doubt 